Good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study at Anola Church of God. I am Craig Dubinsky and we are studying the revelation of Jesus Christ. We've been doing this for some time now and we are having a grand time learning about God and his plan for his planet and how things are going to happen in the end times um, with uh, the revelation. I want to welcome everyone here tonight. We have a nice crowd tonight. And also the, all of you who are watching on Facebook Live and also on YouTube on Sunshine TV. Welcome and thank you for being with us. Why don't we begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you that we can open this book and learn about you because we have a book that is perfect. The Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that we might be, uh, that the man of God might be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so, Lord, like the early disciples, we are searching the scriptures daily because we want to absorb, like a sponge, the truth, the word of God. Open our eyes and ears tonight as we jump into Revelation chapter 11 as we are seeing the unfolding plan of your redemption, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are on page three. Now, we're talking about the two witnesses tonight, and we've talked about them before, and I'm going to point you to some scriptures, so if you'll open up to Revelation 11, the two witnesses have three names. Or three descriptions. I'm going to give you them. They're not on your sheet. You can write these down right opposite where it says two olive trees and two lampstands. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you three pages of passages of scripture that designate them. Uh, the, the first one, number one, is the two witnesses. That's that's what they're called. That is their description. And that's 11.3 that says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. That's Revelation 11.3. And, of course, two olive trees is 11.4. These are the two olive trees. So the two witnesses are the two olive trees. <clears throat> and then also number three, uh, the two lampstands. There's a double metaphor here. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Actually, I made a mistake. I need a pen. I don't have a pen. Does anybody have a pen I can borrow? Yep. Thank you. Craig, you never make mistakes. I make mistakes every day. If you don't believe me, just ask Pam. <laughs> Pam, does he make mistakes every day? <laughs> I told you she I told you that. All right. So anyway, back to what I'm saying. I just realized something as I'm talking. Actually, it's four descriptions. I said three, but it's four. Number one is the two witnesses in eleven three. Number two is the two olive trees in eleven four. And also the two lampstands in 11.4. Okay, that's three different descriptions. What we're doing, Vass, this is not on your sheet. You're writing this right next to two olive trees and two lampstands. I'm giving you the other designations for these same two people because they're referred to four different ways in the same passages. And we're going to look at that a little more. But in chapter 11, verse 10, it says... And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets, that's the other uh, designation, two prophets. So we have two witnesses, two olive trees, two prophets, and two lampstands, and they're all talking about just two people. I'm starting off with this because uh, I've taught this before, not all of it like I'm doing in this uh, church, but... I preached through this and taught this, and, and sometimes people say, well, wait a minute, how many twos are we talking about here? I count eight people. I'm like, no, it's just two. They're just different names. Do some of you have nicknames? 
Do you? Yeah. What's your nickname? Susie. Susie. Okay. <laughs> and your birth name is? Susan. Susan. Do you have another nickname? Have any? Has anybody ever called you anything else? <laughs> no? Okay. Not that she can say out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you would have shared tonight. Sweetie. My husband's called me Sweetie. <laughs> your husband calls you Sweetie? Mm -hmm. He's a smart man. <laughs> sometimes, people, now the reason I ask this is sometimes people with the name Susan sometimes both go by Sue. Sometimes. That's true. Okay, so you got Susan, you got Sue, you got Susie, and you got Sweetheart, so you got four titles too. <laughs> Just like the two witnesses, right? Mm -hmm. But you're only one person, right? Just one. Just one. Okay, so we all with that. So let's go back to verse um, four. Okay, tonight uh, we're looking at uh, verses three and following. Verse 3 said, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. So let's start there. And let's see what John MacArthur says about these two. Um, John says, Olive oil was commonly used in lamps Together, together, the olive trees and lampstands symbolize the light of spiritual revival. So a lampstand gives light, and the oil is the commodity to burn in order to produce light. So this, this double metaphor is all about light. That's what uh, John's saying. Um, and the light is, is spiritual light, speaking of spiritual revival. The two witnesses preaching will spark a revival, just as Joshua's and Zerubbabel's did in Israel after the Babylonian captivity. So those of you that know Bible history know that there's been many, many Old Testament uh, revivals. And uh, I want to share one. Turn with me to the revival under Nehemiah in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 7. Now, while you're turning there, let me just remind you of the history. You remember that Israel was um, ransacked, burned, and the Israelis were carried away in exile. Now, this has happened in modern history, too. Somebody tell me an example of modern world history. It doesn't have to be Israel. It could be any country. Any world history, I can think of four off the top of my head. Some of these. Can you think of one? <laughs> what about World War II? Mm. Who was the dictator? Who was the tyrant? For which country? Any one you like. Pick one. I was going to say there was a lot of them. So pick one. But, yeah. Benito and Mussolini. Pardon? Mussolini. Mussolini. Tell us about that. About <laughs> what about him? At, at, at Where did he go? What did he do? And what was the affect? Okay, well, uh, <laughs> briefly, very briefly, <laughs> no, <I'm> very briefly. <laughs> I don't, I'm not putting you on the spot. Um, okay, mm -hmm. long story short, he was a teacher and then uh, he got involved in politics and he won an election. And his, then his party basically took over Italy. Okay. Did they invade any countries? Uh, yes, they did. Okay. Ethiopia was the first one they invaded, and then there were several others. Okay. That's one example. There's He's many very more. Smart. Are you a teacher, history teacher? I'm a student of history. I love history. Well, here's some more history for you. What about the Germans? The Germans invaded Poland. Yes. Poland is my country, where mm -hmm. my ancestry is from, and they occupied Poland. They uh, they occupied most of uh, of Europe, um, and they did the same thing that the Babylonians did to Israel, where they took over the country, where they um, killed. Uh, thousands and thousands of people where they um, um, carried people off to a 
to a foreign land. And that's what's happening here. We're going to read Nehemiah. The, the Jews were carried away to Babylon, and uh, their country was ransacked. Hitler did it. Um, some other world dictators and tyrants include uh, Idi Amin in, in Africa, um, include uh, Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, he's responsible for thousands and thousands of his people being killed. I mean, we got tyrants and dictators uh, in world history galore. We don't have to look far and deep because there there's lots and lots. And, and that's what's happening in the Bible uh, where the uh, Babylonian Empire has uh, ransacked uh, Jerusalem, has taken Israel and carried the uh, Jews away to Babylon. Well, as time passed, God sovereignly worked and allowed Israel to return to the land to rebuild the walls and rebuild the city. And that's what the book of Nehemiah is about. Okay, and uh, I have a Sunday school book here I'm going to read from in just a little bit that Pastor Sandy and I have taught out of uh, recently. But I want to show you the spiritual revival. That's what I want to show you. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. Somebody Nehemiah. Reads... <clears throat> yes, we're in Nehemiah. Okay. Ezra, <laughs> Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs. Let's wait till everybody gets there. It's page 835 in your Bible. 835. And then Susan will read it when we get it. Everybody get it. I'm just going to wait. Because we're going to look at uh, three or four things there. By the way, while you're all turning there, you'll notice on your sheet uh, that I have used the alphabet from the Hebrew, uh, where it says, wall completed, wall read. You see that? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Daleth, and those are the A, B, C, D in Hebrew. I did that in Greek just so you can see what some of it looks like, and that's what it looks like in Hebrew. Okay, how about 7-1, Susan? Okay, 7-1 in Nehemiah says, After the wall had been rebuilt, and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. Thank you. Turn your page over to chapter 8 and verse 1. How about somebody else reading 8-1? Nehemiah 8-1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring, bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Okay, that is the Pentateuch. That's... Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are the five books. So on your sheet, you'll see under Aleph, the wall was completed, 7-1-A. Under Bet, you see the law was read, 8-1-A and following. And then turn the page again, chapter 9. We're on a roll here. And somebody read 1 and 2. Nehemiah 9, 1 and 2, please. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel, the Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. Thank you. And so on your sheet, you see the wall was completed, 7-1. The law was read, excuse me, the wall was completed, 7-1. The law was read, 8-1. <coughs> And you see genuine confession here in 9, 1, and 2, where the people are separating themselves from other wicked people. Anybody that's ever been involved with drugs or alcohol or any type of addictive source uh, substances, one of the things that people are like that are encouraged to do is to make new friends, to separate from the, mm -hmm. the people that they uh, were involved with because all of the uh, drinking buddies, all the drinking people obviously want you to join them to what? To drink. And all the druggies want you to join them to what? Use drugs. Are they going to go to church? Are they going to take you uh, other places? Usually not because that's what they do. So when a man, when a woman, when a boy, when a girl, when a young adult, when an individual makes a decision for Christ and they're walking 
in a separated lifestyle, they're walking according to the word of God, it, it's real important to make new friends and uh, make sober friends and clean friends. Clean meaning clean from drugs and not people who are using drugs because if you don't, that group, if you continue to associate with that same group, will bring you down, will tempt you, will, you know, the cliche is that you become like those that you associate with. And that is, that is true. So the wall is dedicated. Um, I don't have the passage of scripture for that. Hold it. Huh. I made mis I made another mistake. Oh my! You're yeah. pushing it tonight. I got it. Chapter twelve, <laughs> verse twenty-seven. <laughs> I have two mistakes tonight. Aren't you glad the Bible says that God takes our sins and casts them behind His back? Mm -hmm. So He just took my two mistakes and threw them out. That's a joke. Okay, somebody read for me 27, 28, <coughs> and 29. Chapter 12, 27, 28, and 29. And the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem besought the Levites and all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings, with singings, with cymbals, harps, lyres. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the districts surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages of the Medipathites, uh, also from Beth Gilgal and from the region of Geba and Asmadath. For the singers had built themselves villages around Jerusalem. So we got a great thing here, folks. We have um, the Jews returning from Babylon. We have the wall completed. We have the Mosaic law read. We have genuine confession. We have a dedication of the wall. Now I'm going to read from Life Lessons from Ezra and Nehemiah. I have a summary paragraph. Listen to what it says. In spite of all the external and internal struggles, Nehemiah is able to complete the wall around Jerusalem in just 52 days. He assigns some of the residents to continue protecting the city puts his brother Hananiah in charge and conducts a census or registration of the people. When this is complete, Nehemiah calls Ezra, this is the, another prophet, another book, to read, quote, the book of the law, Nehemiah 8.1, at a public spiritual gathering. Many of the people weep when they hear the words as they are realizing just how they have failed to honor God and failed to live by his commands. Together, the people confess their sin and make a binding agreement to love the Lord and always be faithful to him. So you're going to see something like that in the future. You're going to see something like that in the tribulation period. Go back to Revelation chapter 11. And we already talked about the 144,000 uh, in Revelation, I believe it's chapter 7, where it talks about the 12 tribes, 12,000, uh, excuse me, yeah, 12,000 from each of the tribes. And now you have these two witnesses that are going to do some evangelism. They're going to do some miracles. They're going to do some signs. And there's going to be people that are converted, and you're going to see them in our text in just a little bit. So in verse 5 in your Bible, we're back in Revelation 11, verse 5, and if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. Okay? So you see uh, that they are protected It says, John, regarding that fire, John MacArthur says, this probably refers to literal fire. These two will be invincible during their ministry because they will be protected by supernatural power. 
Now, catch this. The false prophet, the false prophet will counterfeit this identical sign. And that's in chapter 13, verse 3. I'm going to read that, and then we'll go back to 11. 13, 3 says, One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. This is talking about the beast rising out of the sea. This is not a real beast. This is a person. Metaphoric language. And verse 3, One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth, marveled as they followed the beast. This is talking about a counterfeit resurrection. This is talking about a counterfeit miracle where the world is going to follow this false prophet because he is going to have a mortal wound, a death wound, that will be healed. Now this is counterfeit miracle. This is counterfeit Christianity. We talked about counterfeit uh, a time or two. We talked about the U.S. Treasury Department training uh, treasury agents to be able to see and spot uh, counterfeit $100 bills uh, rapidly because they're so uh, well trained in the authentic and the genuine and the real money that when the false money appears before them, they can just feel it, touch it, see it. They can just spot it right off without a lot of uh, difficulty. And so what happens is, uh, this uh, false prophet, remember there's three, and we're going to talk about them on the next page. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but there's Satan, who is the fallen angel. There's the Antichrist, who is a political leader. And there is the false prophet, who is a religious leader. And you're going to see in a little while, I'm going to call them the Trinity, the unholy Trinity. I'm going to get to that. And uh, that's what's going on here, because this false prophet is going to duplicate some of the miracles and lead people to believe uh, that they are genuine. Now you notice verse 6 in your Bible, it says, They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have the power of the waters to turn them into blood, and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. So let's think about, let's talk about this power to shut heaven. John MacArthur says, Miracles have often authenticated God's messengers. <clears throat> the three and one half year drought they will bring, as Elijah did before them. Remember the prophet Elijah? will add immeasurable torment to those experiencing worldwide disasters of the tribulation and will increase their hatred of the two witnesses. So what's going to happen is these two witnesses, there's going to be nobody that's neutral. Nobody. They're, you either love them or you hate them. You either flock to them or you uh, are adverse to them. And uh, these are two that are going to be preaching the word, preaching the grace of God. People are getting saved, but the people that don't get saved are getting harder and harder, more and more angry, and uh, you'll see what they're going to do in just a little bit. I'm going to read my ESV study Bible footnote for 11, 5, and 6. It says, The witnesses especially fulfill the church's prophetic role, pouring God's word as fiery judgment from their mouth, announcing drought like Elijah and turning waters into blood like Moses. And so you see these two witnesses are doing some of the very same things that Moses and Elijah had done. Also in verse 6, it talks about waters uh, turn to blood. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Earth's water system during the tribulation period is already devastated. It's already polluted by the effects of the second and third trumpets. If you remember back to the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. And uh, this water supply will become undrinkable, adding immensely to the suffering uh, caused by the drought. And so um, the two witnesses... 
um, are doing miracles like Elijah did, like Moses did, and um, they are turning hearts toward God, mm -hmm. but not all hearts, because there's a whole lot that refuse to repent, refuse to believe, and become more and more um, hardened as, as it goes along. And then in verse 7, it talks about the beast. And verse 7 says, And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that arises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Gomorrah, or excuse me, Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. So let's take that apart. There's quite a little bit there. Uh, notice on your sheet, top of page 4, under the beast, it says this is a person, and this is mentioned 36 times in the Revelation. He is the Antichrist of Revelation 13. He receives his power from Satan like we receive our power from Almighty God. And then I made this up for you, the false trinity, and I said the false trinity is a counterfeit trinity. The dragon, or Satan, is the fallen angel who wanted to be like God. We talked about that from Isaiah 14, from Ezekiel 28, and other passages. The beast is the Antichrist. He is a worldwide political leader, and the false prophet is a worldwide religious leader. When I use the word worldwide, what I'm communicating is these are two people who are universally accepted and revered, okay? Um, and that's in contrast to the real trinity, the genuine trinity, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this comes from a chart uh, which is on page 2481 uh, of your study Bible and that I have reproduced. And if you look at 2481, those of you that have it, it's down the bottom on the right, and you'll see it's four columns there. And I did not produce it exactly as in your Bible, but the, uh, the main points are the same. So that's the beast, and he is going to do a lot of things. It says in verse 7, that he is going to kill them. Wow. Craig, I thought you said that the two witnesses were protected. I did. Well, what happened? Well, something dramatically happened. John MacArthur says, that, uh, referring to the two witnesses, their ministry was completed and God withdrew the two witnesses' supernatural protection. The beast then will be able to do and to accomplish what many had tried to do and failed. So what you see here is God sends these two witnesses to do evangelism, and they do. They have phenomenal results, and no one is able to touch them. The Antichrist can't reach them. They are totally, fully, completely protected while they're doing their work. And then when their work is done, God withdraws his hand of protection. And then all of a sudden, they are killed. They are killed. Okay. So, what happens? Well, in verse 8, in verse 8, it says, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. Their dead bodies will lie in the streets. Can you imagine driving into Harrisburg and seeing a couple dead bodies on Front Street or maybe uh, on Cameron Street or some other street? Can you imagine driving into Hershey and right across from Hershey Medical Center there's, you know, there's two dead bodies laying right at the entrance to the, to the hospital? Can you imagine seeing dead bodies lying anywhere? Pretty hard to imagine, isn't it? at least here in civilized America. Now, I'm sure there's places, some places in the world where that's, that could be common or could be seen, but not here. But it's going to be uh, in Jerusalem. 
Now, why do they do that? Why do they leave these two witnesses that have been killed, why do they leave them in the streets? Why do they leave them in the streets? Well, John says, refusing to bury one's enemies was a way to dishonor and a way to show contempt for them. The Old Testament expressly forbids this. Now, you have a handout, and I want you to turn there right now, all the way in the back of your package. Keep turning, four, four five, six pages, way, way back. You'll see the sackcloth robe, we talked about that. And you're going to see a sheet that says Jewish Traditions for Death, Burial, and Mourning. And that sheet looks like this. If you're not sure, and those of you that are on the camera, that's what it looks like. And it's in your packet. You see it? Yes. Turn it over to the, to the page, the next page, where it says Burial Societies and Preparation of the Body. Everybody there? <laughs> Can somebody read that first paragraph for me? In biblical times, it was the obligation of a Jewish family to care for their dead and bury or entomb them, but it was also regarded as one of the laws of humanity not to let anyone lie unburied. In larger communities, it became common for individuals or informal volunteer groups to aid those who would struggle with the effort due to age, poverty, or debilitating grief. Thank you. And would someone read that second paragraph, and then that'll be it for this handout. The obligation to bury applies to every corpse, even criminals who have been put to death, the unclean, slain, suicides, and strangers to the community. To be denied burial was one was the most humiliating indignity that could be inflicted on the deceased, for it meant to become food for the beasts of prey. Traditions of compassion thus prescribe burial for all. Thank you. Okay, so I just wanted you to see that under the Jewish tradition for death, burial, and mourning. And this is ongoing. This is not from the Bible. This is, this is Jewish practice. And uh, so for them to leave the two witnesses lying in the street was the greatest insult that could be paid to these two. I mean, think about people that have insulted you. Maybe somebody said, maybe somebody called you a name and you were insulted or offended. Or maybe they said something about your family. Have you ever heard anybody ever say, you can say anything you want about me, but you better not say anything about my mother. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Have you? Okay. They're drawing the line. They're saying, that's it. You say anything about my mother, that's the end. Because I'm going to act. Well, it, it's the greatest contempt greatest disrespect to leave the slain. Well, they not only leave the slain there, they do more than that. And you're going to see that right now. Um, because, well, hold on. Also in verse 8, go back to verse 8, Revelation 11, 8. And called their dead, uh, and let, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. So that great city is what? Where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Exactly. That great city. John says identifying Jerusalem as a city like Sodom and Egypt stresses the city's wickedness. Its Jewish population will apparently be the focus of the witnesses' ministry leading to the conversions uh, of verse 13. And not only that, but it says in verse 9, look at verse 9, for three and a half days, some from the peoples and the tribes and languages and nations will gaze at the dead bodies. Mm. Hey, Pastor Joe, are you doing anything tomorrow? Why don't we just go down to Harrisburg and let's and gaze see at some dead bodies? bodies. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I mean, that's what they're doing. They're gazing at dead bodies. This is pretty sick, isn't it? Talk about mental illness, mental disease. That's a special on TV, you know, the dead bodies. Is it really? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> you don't have to go down to Harrisburg. You can just look on your TV. <laughs> oh, my word. I didn't see that one, but thanks for warning me. I'll, I'll clear of that one. Oh, but it is, though. Is it really? 
Uh, I'll bet it'll be on some kind of a mask because they see it from yeah. all over the world. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Mm. That that is true. That Pastor Joe, you're absolutely right. So anyway, uh, so anyway, for three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And verse 10, and those who dwell on the earth will, notice this, rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. So they're not only going to look at the dead bodies, but they're going to exchange presents. <laughs> Do you exchange presents with your family or friends? Mm -hmm. Not when somebody dies. <laughs> not when somebody <laughs> dies, no. But you exchange presents at other times, right? I'm exchanging yes. presents on Saturday. My granddaughter's birthday is today, May 4th. And she is seven, and she is the youngest of two granddaughters. I have one seven, one fourteen, and I have a grandson who's seven. And uh, uh, my precious wife over here, I think we can say this because they can't hear this. Tell everybody what you bought her. <laughs> They're not watching this, I'm, oh, I'm like, pretty sure. It's one of those sparrow graphs, like she can make all sorts of designs. <laughs> Like and you also bought her, yeah, it's a drawing thing. And then yeah. and then you bought her an outfit. Tell me about the outfit. Oh, it's shorts in the top. Yeah, real cute stuff. My wife is an expert shopper. If you don't know how to shop or you need help shopping, <laughs> she's the expert. And she does all the shopping for the Davinsky Enterprises. And uh, her husband, Craig, doesn't shop at all. I let her do it all, and she does it really, really well. So we're exchanging presents. And you exchange presents at Christmas time, don't you? Don't you buy your kids stuff? Don't you buy your, your other relatives stuff? Most, most people mm -hmm. do. But they're exchanging presents over glorying in the death and in the humiliation and in the decomposition and in the stench of death. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is really something. This is really something. Well, actually, it's not. It's not anything new. They do it now. <laughs> I mean, look how excited the legislators get in states when they uh, pass a bill to do incentivize on babies. Oh, yeah. This is nothing. This is nothing new. You know. You know, people look at this, and this is the way humanity is. <laughs> look at First Corinthians thirteen six. I want somebody to read that. That's an important verse. Down the bottom of page 4, 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Somebody that didn't read yet. I'd like to get everybody in that wishes to read. If you don't wish to read, you don't have to. But if you haven't and you want to, it would be nice. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 6. It's talking about love. That's the love chapter, you know. <laughs> What was it, First Corinthians? Chapter 13, 13 six. and verse 6. The sixth verse of the 13th chapter. Bass and Julia, uh, Bass and uh, Kayla just got a uh, ESV study Bible, and uh, they are uh, excited to begin to read these 80,000 footnotes. <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> okay, who's going to read this verse for me? It does not rejoice with wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Read the first part a little slower. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. That's what I wanted you to hear and think about. And these people are rejoicing over wrongdoing. But love does not do that, does it? No. We don't do that, do we? So now, uh, look at verse 11. We're in Revelation 11, 11. And uh, Revelation 11, 11 says, But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. So you see what's happening. God called them. God protected them. God withdrew his protection. They were slain. They were humiliated. They were denied burial. 
They decompose. Some people say, were they really dead? Well, if you're dead for three days, you're really dead. <laughs> people say, oh, they were swooned. Not for three days they weren't, because decomposition sets in. The body starts to stink. That's why Lazarus was wrapped up. Why? So he wouldn't stink, right? That's why in funeral homes, they, they, um, they um, do all the preparations that they do so that the body doesn't start to decompose or, or to rot. Well, I'm sure these two witnesses had started to decompose because it was three days. So God breathes into them and uh, breath from, of life from God entered them and they stood up and great fear uh, fell on those who saw them. John says, John MacArthur about this breath of life from God entered them says the fact... The festivities, however, are short-lived as God vindicates his faithful two witnesses by resurrecting them. So here you go. You have a genuine resurrection by God, and you have that counterfeit resurrection by the beast, by the false prophet, who is trying to counterfeit God's miracles. So you've got the genuine and the counterfeit, uh, in Revelation, and you can see the difference there. So if you turn your page, we're at the top of page 5. We're at the top of page 5, and verse 12 in your Bible says, Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. So here you see that they uh, ascend into heaven in a cloud. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but in the way I think, I would think that everyone that saw this would be converted. I don't know about you, but, you know, I believe with a whole lot less evidence than that. I've never mm -hmm. seen a resurrection. I've never seen an ascension. But if I was a non-believer, I'd drop to my knees. I'm like, wow, this is an awesome God that can do all these things. But they didn't. And it continues. And it continues. But they were not. Why? Somebody read Luke 16, 31 for me. Somebody read 16, 31 for me. Luke. First one he, gets it, he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if so much rise from the dead. Yeah. There you go. There you go. That's the rationale. That's the reason. And then it says in verse 12 um, that the enemies watched them, or the enemies saw them, and... Um, John says, those who hated and dishonored these two witnesses <clears throat> will watch their vindication. Now, I gave you a handout already, and we already talked about it, but it's in this packet again. I, I reproduced it a second time intentionally, and it's in the back. I am not going to go through that because I went through that once before. Uh, but it's just that one side, which is page 1381 of the um, Prophecy Study Bible. This is uh, Tim LaHaye, Prophecy Study Bible, page 1381. We went through that, so I'm not going to go through that again. So in verse 13, back in Revelation 11, it says, And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. And the rest, notice the rest, the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. So you see two responses here. You see those who harden their hearts and curse God. And you see those, the rest in this passage, 
who are terrified by what they're seeing, and they give glory to the God of heaven. Let's talk about that earthquake for a minute. Okay, that's in verse 13. Why does God use an earthquake here? I think God is attempting to get man's attention. I think he's saying, listen up! Kind of like a teacher in school when the kids get a little rowdy. I told you once before I taught English as a second language to a group of Spanish-speaking children who didn't speak any English by way of a translator. And when I walked in the room, they were... And they were... In Spanish. So I couldn't understand any of their... So I said to the teacher, how do you say be quiet in Spanish? And she said, por favor, silencio. So I said, por favor, silencio. And the room just stopped. You could have heard a pin drop. And all these kids are looking at me like... They think I can speak Spanish, and I can't. I really can't. I know a couple of words. I know the cucaracha. That's the cockroach. That's a song, actually. I remember my sister learned that in Spanish class when she took three years of Spanish in high school. And she used to sing that La Cucaracha all the time and drive my mother and the rest of us crazy with that cockroach. But, <laughs> but I don't know Spanish. But um, I think God's trying to get man's attention here. Now I want to talk about the rest in verse 13. The rest in verse 13. And at that hour there was a great earthquake. Tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. And the rest, that's a group of people, were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. God of heaven, by the way, is a phrase or a title that's used throughout the Old Testament, but it is used only twice, uh, used throughout the Bible, but it's only used twice in the New Testament. The second time it's used is in 1611, and I'm going to read 1611. 1611 says... 10 and 11 say, The angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and the kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. So sad, isn't it? Because it didn't have to happen, did it? As a matter of fact, a lot of suffering today doesn't have to happen either. There are people who are miserable, and some of them are just shooting themselves in the foot. Some of them are their own worst enemy. And they look to God, you know, God, why did you do this? And God didn't do it. They did it. Others did it. But God gets blamed for everything that people, some people, not all people, some people do not want to accept responsibility for you know, we need to take ownership for our words. We need to take ownership for our behaviors. We need to take ownership for our relationships. And when they're good, when they're wholesome, when they're healthy, when they're God-honoring, God sees that, and we will be rewarded accordingly in heaven. But when they're not, we start this downward spiral like a auger that's digging a, a hole for a telephone pole, and it just goes deeper and deeper and darker and darker, and um, it doesn't have to be that way. <clears throat> the Bible says that it's God's will for all men everywhere to repent. This is not my theology. This is straight out of the book. And um, we need to repent of our sin, too. And we sin, too. We make mistakes, and you know I do. My wife verified it, didn't you, hon? <laughs> say, Craig makes mistakes, say it. Craig makes mistakes. <laughs> say, Craig sins. Craig sins. <laughs> Craig can be an angry rascal. <laughs> say it. Craig can be an angry rascal. <laughs> I confess, I did it. But guess what? So did y'all, too. And I know you. <laughs> you people, people are sitting here saying, yeah, I know you. Yeah, I know you too. I know where you all live. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And you know, we need to repent of our wickedness. When we start to do something wrong, we can lust, we can have greed, we can have envy, we can have jealousy. We can have a whole lot of the fruits of the flesh. And those fruits are rotten fruits. You ever had any rotten fruit in your refrigerator? I did. Pam bought strawberries, and they were so luscious and so delicious, but we didn't eat them all. And they got stuck in the back of the refrigerator. And I was rooting around the other day. Remember that pan? Correct me if I'm wrong. I pulled them out and I said, hey, I think these are bad. I showed them to you. What did you see? Uh, white stuff. White stuff! <laughs> <laughs> they were decomposing! Yeah. Exactly. Strawberries aren't white. Strawberries are red. <laughs> that reminds me of that joke where that farmer boy went to college. And he went back to the farm, and he said to his Paul, he said, hey, Paul, I'd like to tell you something I learned in college. So Paul got come up out of the field, and he was bailing hay, and he climbed over the fence and dusted himself off and said, okay, son, tell me, what did you learn? Well, the son did well in college. As a matter of fact, he did well in mathematics, and uh, he was learning uh, different types of math, and he was learning algebra. And he said, Dad, pi r squared. You know, like pi 3.1417. Pi r squared. Trying to impress his dad. And you know what his dad said? No, son. Pi around. <laughs> All right. So, back to Revelation 11. We did the earthquake. We did the rest. They gave glory to God of heaven. And uh, notice... Uh, let's look at Zechariah. Uh, let's look at Zechariah. Now let's skip Zechariah. Let's go to Romans 11. I'm trying to finish these two witnesses tonight, and I only got a couple little bit more things to say, and we're wrapping up the witnesses, the two witnesses. So we're looking at Revel Romans 11, 25 to 27. You know, while you're all turning there, Vass and Kayla, notice page 2178. <coughs> That's only one page away from where you're supposed to be. Yeah. Do you see that chart there, spiritual gifts in Paul's letters? Yes, we do. Isn't that cool? Okay. <laughs> what? I'm just showing something in the Bible because they just got that study Bible. You're such a geese. Bible geek. <laughs> hey, I'm a Bible student. I study the Bible. I got up 6 o'clock this morning, and I was in Daniel 9, and I finished it, and I've been working on that for a while. So somebody read 25 to 27 for me. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Thank you. This is pointing forward. By the way, when it says, as it is written, it's referring to a passage. And I wrote it in my Bible. It's Isaiah 59. 20 and 21. It's probably in one of those footnotes, but I actually wrote it in there. It's looking forward, it's pointing forward to that millennial kingdom because the millennial kingdom will start with everyone who knows the Lord. Now, the millennial kingdom will go on for a thousand years, so people will marry, people will have children, and um, eventually some of those children will grow up and, like modern society, not following the way of their parents, not following the ways of God, and then, you know, you'll have some, some non-believers there. But when the kingdom starts, uh, it starts uh, with Christ as king of Israel. So this is looking forward to that. The deliverer will come from Zion. Zion is Jerusalem. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob being one of the tribes, a part representing the whole, speaking of all of Israel, 
and this will be my covenant with them, that is, that another covenant will be restored, which has been done several times in Israeli history, and take, and when I take away their sins. Okay, question. Did everyone give glory to the God of heaven? We're back in Revelation 11. We're wrapping up the two witnesses. No, Craig, not everyone. So, tell me, who did what? Anybody? You, anybody? The survivors gave glory to God. Some of the survivors gave glory. Yeah, the lucky ones. Pardon? The lucky ones. <laughs> it wouldn't be fair if you were the ones that died. Would, then... had, luck had nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, uh, you make your own luck, is what I believe. I don't believe in luck whatsoever. I believe in the sovereignty of God, and God gives an invitation to all men everywhere. Some believe, some do not. In Romans 1, it says man is without excuse because all men know that there is a God. Read Romans 1 and you'll see that. Okay? Now, not all men have all of the details, uh, but nobody can ever say in hell, the, the reason why I didn't believe is because I didn't have a chance to hear the gospel message. That's impossible. That cannot be based on what the teaching of Romans 1 is. Because Romans 1 talks about the conscience that we have, that we know we're done. Hold it for next time. We're but done. We're talking we're... about Romans 11 now, not yes. Revelation. Okay. No, we're talking about Revelation. We're finishing up. Revelation 11, okay. I'm at the bottom of page 5, okay. and it says the question, did everyone give glory to the God of heaven? And that, the, that comes from that verse we just read a couple of minutes ago, mm -hmm. where it talked about the rest. Okay. Remember the rest? Yeah. During the earthquake? He said there, there was an earthquake, and some died, and then like 7,000 died, and then the others believed in God then. Yeah, that's verse 13. That's exactly right. Yep. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. These are those who repented of their sins. Mm -hmm. These are those who gave God glory. But we've read before, and um, we're, we're reading again, uh, that not everybody repents and gives God the glory. As a matter of fact, um, I don't have the verse in front of me right now, but in another place, uh, it says that they cursed God uh, and did not repent. And so, and so, we, we see the two responses to the grace of God. We see the two answers to God's gift. God's gift is to all men everywhere, and that's the gift of salvation in and through by his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other name, Scripture says, there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's an exclusivity here where there is one way of salvation and it's through God's Son, the Lamb of God. Uh, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And so we see God's gift offered to all men everywhere in Christ. Many are believing, modern day, there are people who are getting saved by the second, by the minute, daily, around the world. And I've led people to Christ. I've seen people come to Christ. Uh, and, and many of you have too. Uh, I've also shared the gospel with some people. And I've had some people tell me, I think that's total foolishness. And I think you're a fool. I've had people say that to my face. And they said, I don't care that you have a PhD. And I don't care that you wrote a book. And I don't care that you're a minister. I don't care that you're a missionary, and I don't care that you have this faith, because you're a fool. I had somebody tell me that to my face. And this was not, this was not 
someone who uh, was uneducated or uninformed or anything. This, this was a person who was a highly educated individual. I can remember witnessing to the chairman of the Department of Philosophy at Prince George's County Community College. This is where I went to school in between going to Bible college where Pam and I met. Prince George's County Community College. He had a PhD in philosophy. Well, I have a PhD in philosophy too, folks. And I shared with him the gospel. I didn't have it then. I was still in school then. This was way back when we were first married in Bible college. And um, I, I shared the gospel with him, and he said, that's foolishness. I said, well, let me explain a couple of things. And I reached into my toolbox, and I pulled out apologetics. And those of you, Pastor Sandy, Pastor Joe, maybe Mark, maybe some of you know that apologetics is a defense of the faith, the defense of the faith, setting forth positive uh, um, rationale that people can believe. It's defending of the faith. So I started to go through all my apologetic toolbox. You know, I used the argument of design. You see this watch? Well, it didn't just fall out of the air, did it? It was designed by a designer, hence God the designer of creation. He didn't accept that. He didn't like that one. I finally, after 25 minutes, finally got around to history. I'm thinking nobody can deny history, right? And so I talked about Josephus, and he was not a believer, and he was an authority in the Jewish faith, and he wrote about Jesus Christ. I have it in black and white. I can show it to you, okay? And he said that Jesus Christ did miracles. And that's a non-believer. You know what he said about Josephus? You know what he said about Jewish history? You know what he said about all the tools in my toolbox of apologetics? He said something I, I have never gotten over. He said something that blew me away. Guess what he said? He looked me straight in the eye and he said, I don't believe in history. History doesn't exist. <laughs> What? <laughs> what? What does that mean? What, where do you go with that? <laughs> I quoted Psalm 16.1 and walked away. Does anybody know what that says? It's not nice. <laughs> the fool has said is in his heart, there is no God. That's it. The fool <laughs> has said in his heart, there is no God. Well, he was also my professor. I was taking the courts under him. I thought, boy, I sealed my fate. I'm going to get an F now. Well, guess what? You know what he gave me? He gave me an A. He did not. He just wanted it. to get along. Just get him out of here. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want get you rid back of that troublemaker. He didn't want you back again. Yeah, yeah I want that back again. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? There is a God, and he's an awesome God. We serve an awesome God, and we need to give him the glory and honor him and revere him and just idolize him because he deserves it. He's not like us. He is holy. He is pure. He is separated from sin. And he is the love of my life. And I pray he's the love of your life. Let me pray. God, thank you. Thank you so much for showing us tonight about the two witnesses and about your plan for the future and how you are saving people today, how you're going to save people in the future, how you are working on your planet. We love you. We thank you for the forgiveness we have in Christ. And we pray that we will walk as men and women separated from our sin and separated to you as we draw near to you, as we cleanse our hands, as we cleanse our hearts, as we confess our sins, and as we seek to walk close to you. Help us, God, this week, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.